Now time for the second breakout session. Here to talk about the new normal, managing the constant stream of new vulnerabilities. From Rackspace, Aaron Hackney. Hey, how's it going? Hey, thank you for coming. I know it's uh, getting late in the afternoon, so the attention span's kind of shortened, and I apologize for that. It's, I, as a guy who comes to these conferences all the time, I get that. Uh, my name is Aaron Hackney. I'm a principal architect for Rackspace. Uh, I work uh, in the network security department, so I deal primarily with firewalls and load balancers. I have around 22,000 firewalls that I keep track of, and um, you know, a, a good thousand, several, well, probably in the 5,000 number of, of load balancers that we keep track of. Um, I love what I do. I'm on an aspiring mission um, to really advance network security at Rackspace and look at the next generation of architecture, the next generation of products, things like that. So uh, it's, it's really an exciting mission. And so they let me out of my hidey hole um, to come out and talk to customers, which doesn't happen very often, because you know, at the end of the day, I'm a guy who sits down and does techie stuff. Um, quick, uh, quick preface to my talk here, this is not a sales talk. I'm talking uh, about general security principles, right? So. Um, this isn't trying to sell you anything on any particular product or anything else. This is just general security principles, right? So um, just a quick preface on that. I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm a techie. That's, that's just the stuff that I do, right? So uh, that's who I am. Um, so um, how was your 2014? Yeah, right? Um, it was a challenging year, wasn't it? And guess what? That's why I named this talk the new normal. Um, this is just kind of the new normal in the network stack, folks. Uh, these vulnerabilities are going to keep appearing regularly. The industry has known about these vulnerabilities that you see on the screen. Most of them we knew about for 10 years, right? And the industry just sort of ignored it um, uh, until it, Edward Snowden and some other things brought some pressure to bear to companies to say, hey, it's time to really up our game uh, in, in the security department. Uh, that and as we see the, the attack services kind of widened, it used to be really the servers were the target of most infiltrations, right? Uh, but to get to those servers, they need to go through the network infrastructure. And guess what's happening to a lot of network infrastructure? They're now moving to servers, right? We're getting software-defined networking. So that's really accelerating the pace at which we see attacks on networks themselves. Quick question for you. It's the middle of the night. You're sitting hacking away in your basement, drinking your Mountain Dew or whatever it is you're doing to keep awake, right? And uh, you discover a new security vulnerability. What's the first thing you do? Do you uh, call the vendor? Contact the vendor, hey, Red Hat, I found a vulnerability in your code. We should probably fix this, right? That'd probably be the responsible thing to do. But anymore, we see people do other things like maybe contact the press. Hey, I want to make a name for myself. Uh, so I'm going to do a press release. I found I'm this super smart guy who found this amazing vulnerability, and I'm going to contact the press. Probably not the best thing for the industry, right? For the, for the greater good, probably not the best thing. Um, vendors have to scramble to do their... their uh, QA, right, to write a patch for it and go through their usual process of, of vetting it out and regression testing and all the stuff that software developers have to do. So they may not be able to get a, a patch out in 24 hours. It might take them weeks to get a patch out, during which time, thanks to this person's letting it out to the world, we're all vulnerable, right? So we've got these things going on like that. Oh, and, and of course, we, uh, we, might, we have to call a graphic designer because if I'm going to release a vulnerability, I've got to have a cool logo, right? Yeah, so we, we got a lot of things out there that we've got to worry about now, right? It's very mainstream. This kind of stuff, 10 years ago, CNN and Fox and everybody else would have just gone, eh, that's nerdy internet stuff, right? Today, that's front page news, isn't it? So uh, very top of mind for the industry because of things we've seen in the industry. So my mission today is to do uh, uh, really one thing, just to arm you with a solid strategy, um, how to secure your infrastructure efficiently. And to that end, um, again, we're not here to scare you. Um, and it can be really overwhelming, right? So it's 2 a.m. and you get that phone call, hey, we just discovered somebody on our network or uh, multiple somebody's on our network. What do we do, right? What's our playbook? Um, it can really feel overwhelming. So what I want to talk to you to do, uh, of course, you've got Rackspace as a partner to help you out, but also you've got some other things that you have to deal with that Rackspace can't, right? Talk to your customers, uh, do triage on your end, things like that. So we want to try to give you kind of a, uh, just kind of a, uh, an overview of how we might attack this, right? Some of you that have been in the security industry for a while, this is probably old hat, so that you won't find this very exciting. 
but it may be just justification and reinforcement of what you've been saying for years, right? Uh, anybody ever uh, seen the TED Talk that uh, Bruce Shiner did? Um, really great TED Talk, if you can look it up. Uh, he's a really interesting guy. He does a security blog, and his security blog is usually really good, very relevant, top-of-mind stuff. And he talks about this thing called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is just a fancy way of saying, hey, does what I feel reflect reality, what really is? And when that's out of whack, when what I feel doesn't reflect reality, that's cognitive dissonance. Uh, and when there is cognitive dissonance, I typically don't make very good decisions, right? And during a security incident, we have to make good decisions, don't we? Well, let me give you an example of some cognitive dissonance. So um, I'm a, uh, uh, let's, let's just say we've got a, a mother, right? A newborn, they're in the maternity ward, the baby was just born, and the mother's got that, that baby in her arms, right? And just an amazing moment. And so a couple hours later, the doctors are ready to do what doctors do with newborns. Um, so I guess they take them away and change the oil and check the fluids. I don't know what they do. But they've got to do something with the baby, right? They're doctors, and they've got to do what doctors do. Uh, what we find is what the doctors found were that the mothers don't want to give that baby up because they have this real fear, this feeling that, hey, I hear babies are stolen out of hospitals all the time, and my baby could get stolen. Well, the reality is, in the United States, that almost has never happened, right? It's, it's extremely, extremely, extremely rare circumstance, and it's usually some family thing. Uh, it, it's probably not going to happen. But to give that mother a security blanket and make their job easier, they RFID banned the baby, and they put RFID monitors around the maternity ward. So if that baby leaves the maternity ward, the alarms go off, and they immediately pounce on and get the baby back, right? So there's a case of cognitive dissonance. She felt insecure, but she was surrounded by a group of caretakers and was probably extremely secure. So there's where a, a case where a feeling didn't match reality. Now let me give you a different one. How about this one? Anybody here ever been to Black Hat in Las Vegas? Uh, DEF CON? Ever heard of it, DEF CON? So DEF CON is this, if you haven't, it's a hacker conference. It's a Black Hat hacker conference. They are going to break into whatever you bring on site. So if you walk in with your company cell phone and your company laptop and you expect to feel safe, that's probably not the feeling you're going to have, is it? You're going to walk into DEF CON, at least I'm going to walk into DEF CON, with a throwaway burner cell phone and a laptop that's been completely wiped and I'm going to use maybe just to browse the web and not even check email on. They have a wall of sheep. You guys ever heard of that? They have a wall of sheep at DEF CON of people they've broken into their laptops and their, their cell phones. So when I go into the DEF CON or a Black Hat conference, I'm going to feel insecure. That matches reality. That's not cognitive dissonance. That's an actual correct perception, isn't it? So I, it's just really interesting uh, when you're dealing with security, what my point of all this cognitive dissonance talk, and if you get a chance to read his or uh, watch his, his TEDx talk, amazing. And he, again, he's a security professional. He's talking in, in the context of security uh, about cognitive dissonance. Um, really good. My point is, take the news with a grain of salt, right? If you're watching it on Fox News and CNN, you're probably not getting the full story. Go to your trusted sources, right? Your, your blogs, your Bruce's blog, the, uh, uh, the national database, all those good things uh, that you would normally do. So security strategy starts with detection. A lot of people think it starts with prevention. Well, if I prevent the break-in in the first place, I don't have anything to detect, so life's good, right? Well, what break-in are you going to prevent? You don't know, right? You don't know how they're going to get in. If you knew, you would have blocked it, and it would have been solved the problem in the first place, right? So there's a great quote, and my, my friend uh, and coworker Major Hayden, um, actually contributed this slide. He said, hey, if I had a dollar to spend, I'd spend 99 cents on detection and a penny on prevention, right? And part of my goal today is to help you understand where to spend your money on prevention. Because you're gonna have a lot of vendors come knocking on your door with new shiny. Hey, I'll prevent any attacks, you're good. Hey, I'm gonna prevent this. Hey, I'm gonna prevent that. It's a little like trying to dam a river by just tossing a brick randomly in the middle of the river, right? You have no idea where that attack's gonna come from. So uh, I'll show you a strategy how we can use our detection to direct where to spend our money later on prevention. Because there is a good spend on prevention, but you have to have a strategy for it. You just can't accept the latest new shiny from the biggest name in the industry, 
probably not going to be the solution that you're looking for. There is no checkbox, easy button that says secure it easy, done, right? It's, it's never a done thing. It's constantly evolving. So the security life cycle, you might see it in a couple of different ways. This is the security life, life cycle model that I like. When we talk about the incident, hey, something happened, right? Um, uh, what do I do? Um, detection, response, prevention. We're going to get into each of these in just a minute. Um, now, when it comes to, again, getting back to that idea of, idea of prevention, right? Let's, let's take a model that we all understand, driving defensively, right? I could, and I wish I would have had, had the opportunity to find a slide of a Mad Max car, right? If you ever saw the Mad Max movies where they got these big regular sedans that they put armor and big spears and all kinds of crazy guns on and stuff. You can get a Mad Max car, right, and drive that and feel pretty safe. Probably not very practical, right? Or you can just drive defensively. Use my mirrors. Right? Use my turn blinker. I know I've driven in Dallas a few times. I know the blinker isn't come on most cars here. But um, the, you know, do all the usual best practices driving. Right? If, you, if you follow the best practices, you're probably going to be a lot safer than somebody who doesn't. And again, the goal is to give you some focus on where to spend that prevention. So keep this life cycle in mind as we go through the next, the next few minutes here. Detection 101 here. I've got one that's free. Logging is free. All your devices log, right? Your Linux servers, your Windows servers, your firewalls, your load balancers, they all generate syslogs. Are you collecting them? Step one. Are you storing them somewhere? You can do it with a simple syslog server that's free on a Linux box. You can do it with a more advanced appliance, like the, uh, um, our partners out here, AlertLogic, has a log manager device you can get. Uh, how are you collecting those logs? Are you collecting those logs? It's really important. Um, what are you doing with those logs once you've collected them? Right? Are you collecting them to do a checkbox and a compliance audit? Maybe for some people that's all they want. That's not much security though. You gotta be able to analyze those logs, to parse that data to find interesting information. Tuning your sensitivity to the logs. Are you getting too much information? Are you getting not enough information? Right. Um, how about this? How many of you people think logging for failed logins is pretty important? So somebody tried to log in and the, the login failed. Yeah, that's pretty important, right? That's an easy, if you get a real noisy attacker, they'll just do a brute force. They'll just try every password they can think of, right? Dictionary attack. But what about successful logins? Guess what, those are pretty important too. In fact, they might be more important. The noisy people I can find pretty quick. But what if I have a sales guy that operates out of central Illinois, right? My, my home area, right? Go Illini. And you've got, a, you've got a salesperson that operates out of Illinois and he connects every day and does his thing in his region there in the Midwest. And then you notice in your logs there's a successful connection attempt from that salesperson in Zurich. The IP address he's sourcing from is from Zurich. Red flag. Hey, it was a su successful login attempt right? But where did that successful login attempt come from? So those are the kinds of things what I mean when I say you need to look at the logs, you need to have an in-depth understanding of what you're logging, um, and you need a way to parse through that. Now that's a lot of information to go through. Um, one of the strategies you can do, because those, if, if you've got a large environment, I have customers at Rackspace that have hundreds and hundreds of servers in their environment. All of those things generating logs, that's a lot of data to sift through. So you can do some scripting, you can buy an appliance like uh, the log manager or some other advanced appliance that can do some uh, filtering and some analytics. You can buy some software to do some analytics. You can even just do something as simple as trending. Hey, web one usually generates about two to six megabytes of log files a day. On Thursday, it produced 125 megabytes of log files. Something's fishy, right? Maybe it's just a misbehaving application or maybe it's something worse. You don't know. So a lot of things you can do to start looking at. And again, logging is free for the most part, right? So we've definitely got some things we can do there. Now, the other thing we can do, um, again, best practices. So logging is a best practice, right? Um, in addition to that, we've got some other best practices that we know that are out there. We know that network segmentation is good. 
So maybe I have this nice application and I develop a new application. And to get it to market faster, well, let's just throw it behind the same firewall segment as my existing application. It's all well and good, but guess what? When, when not if, when one of those applications gets compromised, they're both gonna get compromised, right? You've, ex you've increased your attack surface. Best practice, hey, spin up another network segment. Call network security and say, hey, I need another network segment for this application. Um, it doesn't cost anything extra. Um, it just follows best practice. So following best practices is, is really a huge thing. And, and you'd be surprised how many attacks, when you hear about these things from Target and some of the other uh, uh, places that have been recently compromised, most of the time, best practices could have prevented it. They didn't have to go out and buy a new shiny IPS intrusion prevention magic. They could have just followed best practices. Um, so we've got network, that, uh, network segmentation. There's another tool out there that you may or may not have heard of called NetFlow. Anybody familiar with NetFlow? So NetFlow is a way to collect statistical data. Um, so it's more about statistics and connection endpoints. So a connection was started on the inside segment and ended on the DMZ segment. That would be one piece of NetFlow data, uh, including how much bandwidth was consumed during that point. Um, or a connection from a client in China was spun up to my webhead uh, here at the data center in Dallas, right? Um, another piece of data that could be collected. So what good is that data? Well, one of the challenges we have, and again, getting back to why that new shiny is hard to prevent a lot of attacks, is our attackers are becoming increasingly sophisticated, right? Which makes it more challenging. It's a very cat and mouse game, isn't it? As soon as we come up with something cool to, to stop them, they come up with something cooler to get around it. Um, and one of the things they're doing to make it more difficult for that new shiny to stop that problem traffic, that bad actor, is that the attackers are wrapping their communication, particularly their exfiltration, in encryption, right? They're wrapping it in SSL and using good SSL. Well, guess what? My IDS can't see that traffic. My IPS can't see that traffic. It can see the flow. I can see the TCP flow, source and destination IP, social destination port. They can't encrypt that. That can't be done. But, I, but they can't see the actual payload of the data to say, oh, somebody's exporting a database file with passwords in it. Can't see it, it's encrypted. So NetFlow is another one of those tools, again, looking at trends, analysis, and patterns. NetFlow data can be used and analyze to say, hey, normally on an average day, most of my traffic is traversing North America and Mexico. But all of a sudden, yesterday, I saw a large number of connections pop and head for Russia. Something's anomalous there. Let's start digging deeper. Detection is the key. Remember I said 99 cents on detection and one cent on prevention? Quick poll in the room. What do you think for uh, when a server is exploited or, or a network is infiltrated, how long before the average company realizes that it's happened? Any guesses? Eight, eight months actually is the, the average statistics, right? It's usually eight months and it's typically not the company that discovers it. It's typically one of their customers or some other person saying, hey, why are you attacking me? Because they're using you as a launch point now to attack other companies. So eight months in, they, they, they probably collected all the data they need, right? So detection is where it's at. <clears throat> so uh, we're running out of, we're short on time here, but I'm gonna keep rolling. Incident response. Um, so that's another piece of this puzzle, right? Remember that, that, uh, that life cycle that I showed you about incident, detect? This is kind of covers that life cycle right here. Detect and analyze. So we have to detect that the infiltrations happen, right? And, and again, understand, this is an eventuality. This is not a if, this is a when, right? You will all experience at some point in your careers uh, an infiltration. So you need to be able to detect that infiltration and analyze what's going on in a calm, collected manner. You have to have a playbook. You can't just panic and throw the papers up in the air and, and uh, unplug everything. You've got a business needs to keep the business running. Um, so we have to have a good way to detect and analyze what's going on. Once we understand what's happening, we need to contain and recover. Oh, we've identified these four systems have been infiltrated out of our 10 server farm, right? We'll, un we'll, we'll spin down those four servers 
and try to restore them in a very careful manner, right? So have a playbook for that. Okay, I've been up for 36 hours straight. We've contained and recovered. Business is back to normal. We're back up and running. We're done. I'm going to go home, go to bed, and tomorrow we're going to just continue on like nothing ever happened, right? A lot of companies operate that way, but they're missing probably the most important phase, root cause analysis. What caused this to happen, and how do I make sure that it never happens again? At Rackspace, we take root cause analysis, we call them RCAs, very seriously. If you've ever been to the castle, we actually have boards, giant boards that take up an entire wall where one root cause analysis fishbone diagram will be laid out for all Rackers to see, hey, this is, this is where we failed, and this is how we're going to fix it to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, and so those RCAs, now these RCAs probably aren't security related, they're typically more operational, right? We took down an environment or something happened, but how do we make sure it never happens again? That turns into, how do I spend money? What prevention device could I employ to stop this from ever happening again? Remember, I promised to tell you a way to figure out where to spend your money on prevention? This is where you spend the one penny of prevention. This tells you where to spend that penny. It gives you a very focused target for your spend, which is obviously really important. Incident management is also critically important. You need to make sure you have defined roles for your teams, right? So, hey, you take care of incident management. And one of those key criteria in incident management revolves around communication. How are you going to communicate this? You may have a whole sales force out there that are remotely uh, connected, right? They're, they're road warriors. Or you have a whole bunch of shops. I was talking to uh, one of the gentlemen from the uh, uh, cookie shop, and, and he's got these creative cookies that they sell, right, to shops all over the country. How do you communicate to those people that something's going on without necessarily tipping your hand or whatever, right? Because your, your email communications may be compromised as well. So how do you communicate that, that something's happening, bear with us while we deal with it? So the military uses the, what, the DEF CON system. If you've ever seen war games, when they go from DEF CON 5 to DEF CON 4, it's a big deal, right? And, and everybody scrambles around madly because they all have a job to do and they know what's happening. So maybe you come up with a code word uh, in your email or a code phrase in your email, um, whatever. You can be, have some fun with that, right? Uh, and you can also reduce some anxiety with your workforce. They know, oh, psh, this, thing's not, this thing's slow again. I'm fed up with this. I'm going to go find a new job. Well, no, they're like, oh, wait, something's going on. Something's going down. I just got this you know, code word on the email that, or text message or whatever that something's happening. So I'll be patient while they work through this issue. You also might have a different communication channel for your customers, right? Obviously, what you tell your employees might be different from what you tell your customers in terms of the level of, of, of what you divulge. Uh, but there's, there's definitely some, some communication that needs to happen. Um, so you need to think about that in advance. How are you going to communicate with those groups of people and, and other groups that you may need to talk with? So everybody knows what's happening. We're just about finished here. I've just got a couple more slides, so I appreciate you bearing with me. Um, I did want to talk about uh, after the incident, again, getting back to that RCA phase. Um, how could we make sure this never happens again? Uh, if you've never read this book, Switch, um, they have another book. Anybody read it called uh, Made to Stick? Really, really entertaining book. These, these guys have a wonderful writing style. They're two brothers. And uh, uh, they talk about uh, organizational changes. It's really the book written about network security. They just didn't know they were writing about network security. So I highly recommend that book. Um, uh, it can apply to network security just as well as any other organizational change because sometimes it's really tough to stop inertia. This thing has been going on, oh, well, this is the way we've always done it, right? Sometimes the most dangerous thing in our industry is somebody saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. So sometimes to be a, a change interrupter, um, these guys give you some great strategies for how to do that. But let's talk about that user experience. User experience is really important. Um, if I give a really crappy experience to my end users, how many of you in your Facebook feed have seen people complaining because Facebook changed some minute thing, right? And they just go on and on about it. And I usually post back, well, why don't you just not pay your Facebook bill this month, you know? And they, they don't really have a good response for that. But, but user experience is really important, isn't it? You need to have happy users because you want happy employees and you want happy customers. So user experience is huge. But that's not the only consideration we have to take into account. As a network security guy, I can make the network real secure. I'm just going to get a pair of scissors and cut the wire. The network's secure. Done, right? But we have these other needs that we have to do. We have to serve business needs. We have to serve security and compliance needs. Maybe it's uh, HIPAA. Maybe it's PCI. You've got some other compliance that you need to meet. And then we also have to take the customer requirements. And sometimes it's like balancing a big platter 
on the head of a pin, right? It's really hard to find where that balance is at. And so it's a, it's a tricky act. So it takes this careful review process to bring all these considerations into play and come out with, hey, what kind of process can I use to make sure that we uh, give our users a good experience and yet still provide our, for our business needs and meet our compliance regulations? So it's, it's a tough balancing act. And a lot of people don't really understand the policy part of security is almost as hard as uh, the actual going out and pressing the keystrokes and making the firewall do things, right? So love him or hate him, um, you know, he's kind of a controversial figure, but, uh, you know, this guy, Donald Rumsfeld, had some really great quotes here, and, and actually this is another contribution from, from Major Hayden, so I appreciate him letting me steal this slide from him. Um, Major's his first name, so that always confused me. He's not actually in the military, that's just his first name. Uh, and uh, to me, when I first read this, it sounded like politician doublespeak, right? It really did. But once you start really understanding what he's saying, he's getting at the heart of security prevention and security detection. There are known knowns. Hey, we know SSLv3 is vulnerable and garbage. We know that Heartbleed exists. We know these vulnerabilities are there. Those are our known knowns. We have un known unknowns. I know that at some point, there's gonna be another SSL vulnerability in TLS 1.2 because it's based to be backwards compatible with TLS 1.0. So I know at some point there's gonna be another vulnerability because its underlying concepts and philosophies are just as flawed. I just don't know what that vulnerability is yet. That's a known unknown, right? Um, but the unknown unknowns, those are the ones that are a little bit scary, right? I have no idea. Something's gonna come out of a left field on an idle Tuesday uh, and we've got something new to deal with. Um, that being said, uh, I don't know, how are we doing on time? We're done? Oh, sorry, yeah, see, I'm looking at a clock. <laughs> What's it supposed to read, I'm sorry. I got a few minutes for questions, right? Okay, I got, I got like two minutes for questions. Um, I'll open it up, feel free to ask away. Don't be embarrassed or shy. Yeah. Okay, sure. That's a great question. I'm gonna direct you to Jason at the S Managed Security. We have a brand new group called Managed Security where we're, we're taking the model of fanatical support and applying it at the security layer. And it's a brand new group and Jason uh, is out here at the table right at the uh, entrance here. And uh, I'm gonna direct you to him because I don't know the answer to that question. Anything else? Yes. Okay, great question. So um, we run across this a lot, and I'll tell you how we usually uh, find out about it. So um, if the customer's not paying for an IDS, and so it wasn't discovered um, that there was some nefarious traffic, or for whatever reason, the IDS didn't catch it, right? Maybe it's some one of those unknown unknowns, right? It came out of the blue. The way we usually find out about it is through our, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, a, uh, acceptable, acceptable use group, right, from our legal group. Um, AUP violation, that's what I was trying to think of, right? Put me on the spot. Um, and it's usually a complaint from someone else saying, hey, your server is being used to attack my server, right? In those circumstances, we do come help you, right? So number one, we'll try to take the affected server down out of rotation and obviously contact the customer right away um, and work with you to restore that service and then try to identify how they got in. If it's a well-known supported service that we, we offer, right? So if it's like Apache, IIS, common exploit, we'll work with you to try to get around that patch, right? And, and get that fixed. If it's some custom application, like, hey, it's a particular WordPress plugin, we may not be necessarily experts, but we have partners that we work with that we'll try to connect you with to, to make that happen. So we do as much as we can. Again, my, 
our server admins bend over backwards, particularly when there's a, uh, something like that happens. They will bend over backwards to figure out how did this happen, how did they get in, what do we know about it. They'll start looking through the logs of the affected servers, things like that. Does that help? So again, talking about building that action plan, maybe part of your action plan is immediately calling support or calling your account manager and saying, hey, what kind of resources can you line me up with? What kind of partners can you connect me with to help me understand what happened and, and how to you know, RCA it or make sure it doesn't happen again? Yes. That's, that's a great question. So uh, his question was, um, I've got servers, we've followed best practices, we've been scanning them regularly, um, we've been uh, doing the right thing, and yet we find an infiltration. And he's wondering, how often do we see that? Is that does that answer your question fairly? Is Peter in the room? He was here earlier, Peter from Alert Logic. There he is. What would you say? What do you think? So uh, following all best practices, doing all the right things, and yet I find that my server's been compromised. How often do you see that, do you think? So we're on the communication piece, right? So you can communicate, hey, we were following best practices and this thing still happened, right? And, and so you can be honest with your customers and, and uh, uh, clients. Um, as far as a percentage, I don't have a number for you. Um, you've reduced your attack surface as much as you can at that point, and really you've done everything you can, right? And, and again, network infiltrations of, uh, you know, an inevitability for the most part. I mean, you've seen the news, right? The, uh, U.S. government was recently attacked. What was the IRS? Um, all those employee records got out. Sure. Human resources, is that what it was? Yeah. So, so um, yeah, I, I don't have that number for you. All I can do is just recommend best practices, right? It'd be an interesting number to find out, though. Other questions? So a physical environment that you want to protect from the network. So can, can you give me a for instance? Gotcha. Um, yeah, I believe with the Rat Connect Anywhere product, I don't know if you were here for Matt's session, the one before this, I believe Rat Connect Anywhere will enable us to do that. So where we can just basically make that remote data center an extension of your existing firewall environment, and we'll be able to IPS or, or IDS rather, all the traffic going in and out of that firewall connecting to that data center. So I think Rat Connect Anywhere is gonna be the answer to that for a remote data center. Um, good question, that, that's a use case I hadn't thought of. Other questions? silence. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. I'll be out in the hallway and I'll be at the cocktail hour afterwards and I'll be glad to uh, talk one-on-one -on -one about any of the netsec -E type load balancers, firewalls, those kinds of questions are kind of in my wheelhouse. I'm glad to connect you with other people if it's outside of my wheelhouse. So thanks a lot. See you next time. <laughs>